Uh, if you are new with us, I'm Eric Targe. I serve here as the pastor for teaching and preaching. It is such a blessing to, to be with you all this morning. We are continuing our series through the book of Luke, the gospel according to Luke that we call No King But Jesus. We, we say that because we believe that we live in a world of competing kingdoms. There are constantly people that are vying for our allegiance, whether it be politicians, whether it be interest groups. Everyone wants to, to have our allegiance, but no king is worthy of it. No king but Jesus. So I have to start by asking you a simple question. Who do you trust? Like, it's really hard to trust someone, isn't it? It's hard to, to believe that we will be provided for in the ways that we desire. I mean, this was the conundrum that was faced by District Attorney Harvey Dent in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. Dent becomes consumed by his desire for, for vengeance, and despite Batman's efforts to stop him, Dent embarks on a violent rampage targeting those he perceives as responsible for the corruption of Gotham City. He's unable to, to trust in the provision of justice, and so he takes matters into his own hands, succumbing to his thirst for revenge and becoming the very thing he sought to destroy, transforming into the villain, do you know? Two-Face. Now, I know that's DC, and so I've offended some Marvel fans. So maybe we can think of Peter Quill, Star-Lord, played by Chris Pratt in the Marvel movies, who, when he learns that the villain Thanos has killed the love of his life, Gamora, he becomes consumed by rage and attacks Thanos inadvertently, sabotaging the Avengers' plan and enabling Thanos to wipe out half of life in the universe. When things got personal and difficult, he stopped believing in the team to provide. You see, trusting someone to provide is pretty difficult, especially when we think that we can provide for ourselves better than others can. So the, so the passage that we're looking at today is all about trusting in provision. And my hope is that today we're going to see very clearly that Jesus is the king who provides. It's actually just a one-point sermon today. Normally you get three or four or however many if Nate's preaching. Uh, but today, <laughs> but today you get one. Jesus is the king who provides. Now our modern concept of, of the role of king is to, is to serve people right? But it's that. It's modern. In fact, when we think that our leaders are supposed to serve and provide for us, that is our culture unwittingly seeking to enforce the standard that Jesus set 2,000 years ago. The kings of Jesus' time, they didn't exist to, to serve people. People existed to serve the king. Now, Israel was always supposed to be different. Israel was supposed to have a, a servant king, but no king actually lived up to that standard no king, but Jesus. Jesus is the king who provides. He's the king who serves. He's the king who, who meets the people and provides for their needs. And my hope for today is that we might see in three movements of this passage, not three points, but three movements that we would see as Jesus sends, as Jesus is being sought, and as Jesus satisfies, that Jesus is the king who provides. So would you, would you pray with me? And then we'll, we'll hop into our text. Lord, we know that you are the one who provides. It's been said for millennia that you are Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Yireh, the God who, who meets our needs. And so we pray this morning that we would we would see that, hear that, feel that, know that as we meditate on your word. Lord, that you would sustain us this morning. Lord, we know that we are in a season right now where at times because of 
politics, because of war, because of natural disasters, because of just illness, whether it be viruses or cancer or mental anguish, Lord, we, we, we wondered, like, do, do you provide? But we pray, Lord, that this moment we would not put those questions aside, but rather we would bring them to your throne and allow you to answer us in this moment we have together. Speak to us, Lord, and speak clearly. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So our text begins in Luke 9, verse 1. That's how far we've made it in the book of Luke thus far. As you can tell, we are going to be in this for multiple years, and that's okay. But Luke 9, verse 1 says, And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. The twelve are sent out. If you've ever heard the word apostles, right? We've heard that word. It's, it's from this verse, verse two, that we get that word from. He sent them out in the original language, apostello. And he, he sent them out as 12. Now that's not an accident. Just as there were 12 sons of the man Israel that would become the 12 tribes that would incorporate the nation of Israel. Israel. Now Jesus sends out 12 to proclaim his kingdom. Luke is showing us how, how Jesus is providing through recreating his people. Now it's important to note before we go further that this word recreation that I'm talking about here is not a work of replacement. Rather, it's a, it's a call to, to a remnant of the faithful. We need to remember that the 12 apostles and Jesus himself are all Israelites. They're Jewish. It's, it's, through these G, it's through these Jewish apostles that Jesus creates a remnant that will be his new people. The new people he's creating for his kingdom and sending out is not meant to disregard the old. Rather, it's created from a remnant of the old to be made into something new. Verse 3, and he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And so I've been praying about that, that verse quite a bit. And as I've prayed about it, I've thought uh, that I, I wanted to give a very special announcement. I have not cleared this by Nate. And so forgive me, Pastor Nate. But for those of you who love the Lord... And those of you who want to see the kingdom on display, I'm going to be leading a very special trip tomorrow at 5 a.m. And I hope to see you here. Meet me on the corner of Larrabee. And I realize you're probably wondering, like, how long will we be gone? I don't know. doesn't matter. And you're probably wondering where we're going so that you can pack the right things. But don't worry about that. Here's the kicker. <laughs> I don't want you to pack anything. Don't pack clothes. Don't pack anything. Just trust me. Show up at the corner at 5 a.m. and we're going out. Now, I have a strong feeling that tomorrow morning, if that was actually serious, I'd be twiddling my thumbs on Larrabee for quite a long time. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, take nothing for this journey. This journey that has, that has no time limits, that has no space that we are saying that we are going to go. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money. Do not have two tunics. These are all means of provision and self-protection. A staff would have been used to fight off wild animals or robbers. A bag would hold on to supplies. Bread is a symbol for food in general. And a tunic, just to be incredibly crass, this is the word that was used for the piece of garment that was closest to the skin. This was your underwear. Jesus says, before you hit the road, I don't want you packing heat. I don't want backpacks, snacks, cash, Venmo, Zelle, or Apple Pay. Or I don't want you bringing an extra pair of underwear. Instead, I want you to rely entirely on God. So who's with me at 5 a.m.? Ooh, I got some youth group people. That's awesome. Jeff, say goodbye to your daughter. Who knows when she's coming back? <laughs> no, please don't show up at 5 a.m. tomorrow, people. <laughs> this is important. Jesus wants his people to, to trust in God entirely. 
This is a radical statement. Keep looking with me at verse four. And whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Jesus is telling his apostles that they are not allowed to be like the traveling preachers of their day who ditch their first host when someone down the street offers them a, a nice suite with a king-sized bread, private bathroom, and a balcony with a Sea of Galilee view. You see, following Jesus is not about using your power to manage provision. It's about trusting a powerful Jesus to minister his provision. You see, Jesus is the king who will provide. This is, this is what Jesus is getting at, even in the sending, which means that I don't need to live like a king because this is not the kingdom that I am living for. Is this the kingdom you're living for? You see, whereas our culture says that the moment we're offered more money and more private space, we should take the offer, pick up and leave. Jesus tells his followers to consider deeply where it is that the Lord has sent them. Now, I'm not saying that if you believe that the Lord has called you someplace new, that you should disregard his calling, stay at Chicago at all costs. I mean, I'd very much like that. But that's not necessarily what he's saying. You see, sometimes through prayer, it becomes abundantly clear that it's time for a transition. I mean, this time last year, I mean, I'd be the hypocrite of hypocrites. This time last year, my, my wife and I, through significant prayer, felt like the Lord was calling us to transition our ministry down the street from the Moody Church to, to Park Community Church. And for some, God's call will require a painful obedience and faithfulness. That painful obedience and faithfulness will demand that you go. For others, you'll experience what the disciples experience time and time again. You will be rejected and you will need to find another avenue to, to do what you believe the Lord has called you to. But for most of us, we need to be careful about picking up and moving for the purpose of convenience, efficiency, and personal comfort at the expense of what the Lord might be calling us to. We need to be careful about living for comfort in this kingdom rather than in the coming kingdom. You see, Jesus' call, it's costly. Verse, but verse 6 tells us the disciples obeyed the call and they departed and went through the villages preaching the gospel in healing everywhere. Friends, the disciples believed that Jesus is the king who provides. Do you? Where has he sent you? Where does costly obedience send you? What does it look like for you? What would it take to, to rely on him radically? This month is Global Awareness Month, as Pastor Nate was talking about a little bit ago, and as we, we watched in that, that short video. And it's a reminder that some people who have been here at Park Near North were not called to stay. They were called to go, to serve as, as global partners because God told them to leave the comfort of their friends, their family, and their finances to go to various parts of the world where the name of Jesus is unknown, largely ignored, or greatly misunderstood. You see, maybe this month, as you've heard scripture in various languages or heard the stories of our global partners, you've begun wondering, is, it, is the Lord sending me? Is it, is it my time? Am I... Am I supposed to go? Friends, I just want to challenge you. Don't ignore that call. Wrestle with it. Pray through it. Our friend Sarah read scripture in Urdu last week. And if you don't know this, the Ansari people, more than 12.5 million in India who speak Urdu, are considered the fourth largest unreached people group in the world. Listen, I don't know who the Lord is calling you to. Perhaps it's across the world, but maybe it's you're in your apartment building, the floor you live on, your city block, or someone on the opposite side of the globe. You see, too often we look at what we have been provided and then make the decision to follow God's leading. We tend to want to show God our, our five-year plan and show him our pin on the map and then wait for his yes. 
but we need to give God our yes and let him write the plan and put the pin on the map. The 12 apostles, they, they trusted Jesus' sending and saw that Jesus is the king who provides. Jesus sends, and then our text shows that Jesus is sought. Look at verse 7. Now, Herod, the Tetrarch, uh, heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John, I beheaded. But who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. As news spread rapidly about this craftsman turned traveling rabbi who in his early 30s garnered a great crowd that was watching him and waiting to, to see him perform miracles of all types, word got to Herod the Tetrarch who had believed himself to be the great provider of the Jewish people. I mean, his father Herod King Herod rebuilt the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and desired for the Jewish people to accept him as their king, though they never did. This Herod, you see there are two Herods, this Herod, the king, that king's son, likewise desired to, to be accepted as king, but not even Caesar would give him the title this time. Rather, he's simply the Tetrarch. So you got to imagine what Herod's thinking. Who is this Jesus? Who does he think that he is? People are saying he might be the Messiah, the rightful king of Israel. So Herod seeks him out and not to share a cup of tea. Now understand, verses 7 to 10 that we look at here, that's not a digression. This is still all about provision. Jesus tells his disciples that he, he wants them to place radical trust in God's providence. But this passage tells us that John the baptizer, who did this, he placed radical trust in God, is dead. I mean, the last time we heard from John in this gospel, in this gospel he, was, he was sitting in prison and struggling with all sorts of doubt, asking, is Jesus the one or, or should we look for another? John suffered in prison until Herod's daughter, in a game of quid pro quo, requested John's head on a platter as a means of revenge for her mother's embarrassment when John questioned their immoral marriage. We're talking about provision today. And so how could we not address this? I mean, in a moment, we're, we're going to see the scene where Jesus provides 5,000 hungry people with bread. But to be honest, they probably could have skipped a meal. They could have done some intermittent fasting. It wouldn't have killed them. Maybe some would faint, but like, hey, you'd be fine. Meanwhile, John, he's beheaded in prison. Where was God's provision then? How can we say God provides when he allows someone to suffer mental anguish without deliverance? How can we say God provides when people die in concentration camps? How can we say God provides when illness, poverty, and evil prevail? I mean, these questions are incredibly painful and real, and we, we face them on a regular basis, maybe either in your own hearts or in the hearts of those that we interact with. But God is not embarrassed of these questions. That's why in his sovereignty, they are in his book that we are reading today. John was beheaded. A man who gave his life to bring glory and prepare the way of Jesus received an earthly reward of imprisonment and brutal execution. With that reality, how can we say that God provides? You see, if you're wrestling with that question today, because of this passage or because of your own personal encounters with, with this brokenness in a fallen world, it might be helpful to know that there is an entire field of theology dedicated to this question. It's called theodicy, seeking to answer the question of why a good God permits the manifestation of evil. Some have called this even the, the problem 
of evil. And one of my favorite theologians, John Swinton, wrote a beautiful book on this topic. It's called The Raging with Compassion. That's the book. And he, and he says in this book, the real problem of evil is not simply that evil and suffering exist, but, but rather its ability to separate suffering human beings from the only true source of healing and hope. Evil is that which destroys hope in and love for God. You see, I think, I think Luke wants his readers to sit in this dissonance. John was not protected. Will Jesus and his disciples be? How do we respond to this atrocity and the many, 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 many atrocities of this world? Again, I think John Swinton is incredibly helpful here. He's been helpful to me, arguing that when we ask the question, why does a good God permit evil? We actually ask the wrong question. The God of the Bible actually hates evil, and he does not permit it. All throughout scripture, we see that God is not permissive of evil, but rather his patience is a grace meant to lead us to repentance. John Swinton says that instead of asking, why does God permit evil? We should ask, how will a good God respond to evil? You see, this doesn't mean we can't ask why. Jesus on the cross cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, which is in the hymn book of Israel, meaning God wants us to ask the question why. He says, listen, that's, it's okay for us to, to ask why, but he wants us to know that there is an answer. He will bring justice. He will restore what is broken. He will make all that is sad untrue. He will provide. You see, from an earthly perspective, it's hard to say always that Jesus is the king who provides. When we see the story of John the Baptist, it's hard to say Jesus is the king who will provide. But with eternity in mind, we know that Jesus will provide justice for, the John, for John the Baptist and the many John the Baptists of this world. And he will provide judgment for the Herod's of this world. You see, in Jesus being sought, even here, because of God's lack of embarrassment over this scene, we can trust that Jesus is the king who provides. But let's look at this last movement of the passage where we see not just that, that Jesus sends and Jesus is sought, but that Jesus satisfies. Look at verse 10. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Jesus now is trying to get some intentional time with his core team, maybe for prayer, maybe for training and development, or maybe just to, to guide them to a different people group that he believes need to, to hear the kingdom. Either way, when word gets out, that the, when words gets out on where he is, the crowds come, and they are not just tolerated. Rather, our text says that Jesus welcomes them. Look at verse 12. Now the day began to wear away and the 12 came and said to him, send the crowds away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provision for we are here in a desolate place. If you want, I want to encourage you just to underline that, that, that little phrase, desolate place or circle it because this is a major oversight by the 12 apostles. <laughs> There's no provision in a desolate place. What they forget is that Jesus thrives in desolate places. It's like his favorite place ever. Earlier in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 5, it says, Great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities, but he would, with, he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. When Jesus was in need of provision, he regularly went to the desolate places. It was always in desolation that Jesus found provision. Think, for, think with me for a moment, just back a couple of months ago when we were going through the temptation of Jesus by Satan. Where was he? He was in the desolate places. He was in the wilderness. And it was there in the desolate wasteland, the barren wasteland that Jesus found, a fruitful oasis. 
Jesus found that God's presence and provision flowed not from preserving indulgence, but from an emptying silence. You see, the desolate places are where Jesus learned to trust in the Lord's provision. So keep reading with me as we see the the apostles oversight. Verse 13, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. They said, "Uh, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. I mean, isn't this incredible? There are no stores, no nearby lakes for fishing. They're in the middle of nowhere in a place that Jesus took them to withdraw to. They didn't choose to go there. Jesus took them. And now he's telling them to give the people something to eat. I can't help but imagine what's running through the, through the apostles' minds. Us give them something to eat? Us? Are you serious, Jesus? I mean, you're the one who brought us out here to this desolate place. You're the one who welcomed the crowds. And you're the one who gave the extra long sermon on the kingdom of God that clearly went over the allotted time because these people are famished. And now you're telling us to give them something to eat? Jesus, we have five loaves and two fish. That's barely enough to feed 12 men plus Jesus. And you want us to feed the crowds? Verse 14, for there were about 5,000 men. We don't even know how many women and children were there. Surely the disciples think he is out of his mind. But Jesus wants his disciples to understand something about provision. And so he does this in the context of food. Jesus said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had all of them sit down. For the Israelite reader, this, they would have noticed something peculiar here in what Jesus was doing. You see, it would have reminded them of Exodus 18 or Deuteronomy 1 when Moses divided Israel by having them sit in groups of hundreds and fifties. Jesus is making a new people. Verse 16, a new people to provide for. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Now, can you imagine this scene with me? 12 disciples, five loaves, two fish, and 5,000 people. This means that each of the disciples had less than a half a loaf of bread and basically half a can of tuna. Each of them to feed 416 people. Yet somehow, Jesus supplies their needs. And they're all satisfied. I mean, this would have reminded those present of Exodus 16 and the miracle of manna when the Lord rained down sweet bread for the people in the desolate place of the wilderness after the Israelites were freed from Egypt and made into a new people. At least 5,000 are fed here with five loaves of bread and two fish. What's Jesus doing? I mean, at least 12 men thought it would be sensible to send the people back to their homes or into town But Jesus was not done with his teaching and felt that food would be the place, it would be the way that he could get his point across. Recently, I've gotten into reading the the classic tales of Winnie the Pooh to my children, mostly because I just love making voices. And and one one of my favorite stories in in the Pooh series, uh, Piglet says to Pooh, when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you say to yourself? What's for breakfast, said Pooh. What do you say, Piglet? I say, I wonder what's going to, hap- what's going to happen exciting today, said Piglet. Pooh nodded thoughtfully. It's the same thing. <laughs> Surely the, the people who came out to hear Jesus were not expecting food at this gathering, but they were expecting something exciting. 
Remember, Jesus did not call the crowds to himself. They found him. He welcomed them. His disciples did not bring Hebrew national hot dog carts, and there were no Sabra food trucks serving pita and hummus. There was no guarantee or expectation for any people here to get food. So why did Jesus do this? He's giving a glimpse into his identity. He is displaying his glory as John 1.14 says, glory is of only the son from the father, full of grace and truth. And he's revealing his glory, not so that we might get excited about how useful he might be in, in getting what it is that we want, but so that we might see that he is better than anything we could ever have wanted. You see, Jesus making bread like God made manna is meant to show that the son of God has come into the world not to give bread, but to be bread. Jesus says in John 6, 51, which is telling the same story as, as we're looking at here. He says, I am the living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. I think the writer of, of Luke is trying to make this exact same point, but he's actually doing it in a, in a little bit more of a clever way. If you notice, John typically is just straightforward. He says things as they are, but, but Luke wants to, to, to set us up for something else. He's trying to make that connection. If you look at verse 16, look at verse 16 with me. And again, if you've got a pen or if you're using an iPad or a phone, find the way to highlight these words because they're going to be important. He says in verse 16, circle and underline, taking the five loaves and two fish, look there. Then look at, he says a blessing over them, underline blessing. And then he broke, underline broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. Notice, taking, blessing, broke, gave. Those are the words I want you to highlight. And then I want you, after you mark them, I want you to put your finger in the Bible if you have a hard copy Bible and flip over to Luke 22. Verse 16, later in the text, where we see Jesus institute the Lord's Supper. Because interestingly, you'll see he took bread and when he had given thanks, that's a form of blessing, he broke it and gave it to them. Take, bless, break, give, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's the same actions. You see, Jesus is revealing his power to his followers so that they might know that he is not simply the provider. He is the provision. Other kings wield their power so they might lift themselves up so that they can live the good life. Jesus reveals his power so that he might lay his life down so that people, his people, might have life and have it abundantly. <laughs> what kind of king does this? No king, but Jesus. Jesus is the king who provides. So do you trust his provision? You see, in the beginning of this passage, Jesus tells his disciples to, to trust in God. By the end, it's, it's clear that his message was even a little bit more profound. Jesus is the God they should trust. He is the one who provided the manna to the people in the wilderness. He is the one who will bring justice for John the Baptist. And he is the one who sent them out in whom they need to rely on. You see, don't forget that Jesus told them in the first movement, no backpacks, no bread, no money. Now they're out in a desolate place and they have found the provision of a couple of loaves of bread and fish. They've got their provision but Jesus tells them to give that up as well. I mean, that would be an incredibly hard pill to swallow, wouldn't it? Lord, you provided for me, and now you want me to give it up? Isn't that just the way of God? I mean, think about it. Abraham, finally, I've given you a son. I've provided. Okay, time to give it up. This is, this is what God calls us to. But here's what Jesus wants us to understand. When you dedicate yourself to serving him, pouring out your heart and soul until you feel you've given everything, he's got you covered. 
He will always be sufficient for you. The more you provide for others, the more he will be your provision. The more you give life to others, the more he will be life to you. Or in the words of the 19th century British missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. God's work in God's way will never lack God's supply. What kind of king provides in this way? No king, but Jesus. Jesus is the king who provides. You see, in just a moment, we are going to take of the Lord's Supper. Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples. He did this in the feeding of the 5,000 and made it a practice of the church in his very last meal with them in in what was the, the Passover Seder. In the Passover Seder, there are actually four cups that are, that are taken as you take matzah and, and drink the glass. This week, if you don't know, has been Passover. It comes to an end tomorrow, the feast of Passover. And as the Passover feast would go, the last cup, the very, very last cup that they would take was the cup of praise, the cup of, of expectation. The kingdom is coming. All is about to be made new. Friends, when we, when we take, bless, break, give, and receive the bread and the cup this morning, we are proclaiming our trust in and allegiance to Jesus, that he is our provider, and that he will return to take of the final cup, that he said, I will not take of this cup again until I return. That day is coming. This is a reminder. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Corinthians that we, we take this bread and we take this cup as a proclamation that he has died for us until he returns. He will return as our king to provide justice and to make all things new as they should have been. Jesus said that the bread we eat is, is his body broken for us. The cup we drink is his blood poured out for us. And so, friends, we should only participate in this today if we are actively following him, hoping in him and relying on his provision. If you don't know him, or if, if maybe you do, but you're walking in unrepentant sin, or you're, you're harboring anger toward a brother or sister in Christ, refusing his promise to provide justice and his payment for all his people's injustices, I want to just challenge you, don't take this morning. In fact, the scriptures tell us that if we do, we might be eating and drinking judgment on ourselves. Do that carefully. But if you're walking with him, or maybe you're today, you're you're ready to declare your allegiance to him. We want to invite you to participate in this feast. The Anglican priest and poet Charles Wesley once wrote, Come sinners to the gospel fest. Let every soul be Jesus' guest. Ye need not one be left behind. For God hath bid all humankind. Come to him who bids you today. Turn to Jesus, the king who provides. Would you pray with me? And I'm going to invite Pastor Nathan up to lead us in the Apostles' Creed and the taking of the Lord's Supper. So, Father, we ask that that you would meet us now. Lord, if there are sins in our hearts, injustices we have committed, or justice that we have left undone, would you convict us of this at this very moment and cause us to call out to you, to repair those injustices, to repent of our evil, to to be right with our brothers and sisters and forgive them. And for those here, Lord, who, who do not yet know you, Lord, we pray that today might be the day that they declare their allegiance, that they declare their unity with you, that they begin that life of following you. Lord, let this be a moment as we take, not a moment of guilt, but a moment of celebration and expectation in your provision. Meet us here. Change us here. Revive us here. We pray 
in the matchless name of our King Jesus who provides. Amen.